I don't have any candy, I'm sorry. Uh, I, asked, I haven't been to Costco in a few days, and um, I asked my wife to buy some, so it might be some Monday. So, what was the question? Did, did, uh, did you have a specific question? I put the notes on the uh, You did put the notes online, okay. And were you just doing the same thing? Did you just work through this example that we had about the Uruna effect? Or? I'm sorry, did you hear you? What? Did you just work through this example of this Uruna effect, or however you say it, Uruna effect? This idea that in the accelerating reference frame you detect particles in the vacuum? Well, yeah, it's, it's what I worked through on Monday was um, the fact that if you have an observer in an accelerated, in a, in a, in a, in a rest frame that's undergoing uniform acceleration, then the dete a detector in that frame will experience a, a temperature proportion to the acceleration. Mm -hmm. And um, the, 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 re the result um, is quite magical because it, it brings together things that are um, so the temperature is h bar, the acceleration, divided by 2 pi c, the Boltzmann constant. I'm writing k sub b because k, we often use momentum, k for momentum. And uh, in a local gravitational field, g, where g is the local acceleration of gravity, Hawking showed that the equivalent temperature was the same formula. So, so for uniform acceleration alpha, the temperature is is that, and if it's effectively by the equivalence principle in a static but gravitational field with a local acceleration g, which is here 9.8 meters per second squared, uh, there's an equivalent temperature. And of course that temperature for 9.8 is pretty damn small. Um, it might be fun to work it out just since we're standing here. Does somebody have an internet connection so we can? Okay, so. Uh, so we need a, we need to, let's use MKS and let's be generous in let's not be too two pi is six uh, C is three ten to the eighth so what I need is H bar and K you want H bar and K H, uh, H bar which is Planck's constant divided by two pi in MKS. I want to get a real number as a I mean, a, equivalently, we could. H bar over C actually is a. Uh, is a. Um, H bar is like. H bar is like 6 times 10 to the minus 34. Excuse me? H bar is like 6 times 10 to the minus 34, right? Yeah. Is it? Yes. Is is it? it? That's right. Hold on, hold on. So H. Okay. Wait, H. You have it? That is it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, in joules per second, it's 6.62 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per second. That's h, not h bar. Divide that by 2 pi. So I'll Oh, shoot. yeah. So just drop the 6. Just drop the 7. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> and then uh, kd is like 10 to the minus 23. It's 1.38. 10 to the minus what? 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. Okay, so the temperature in this room, if we had no heat, the temperature due to the uh, Earth's gravitational field would not be very high. Uh, let's see, we've got um, 7 cancel 7, so we've got 1 over 18. And we've got 10 to the minus 35. Oh, I'm sorry, 33. And down here we have uh, uh, 10 to the minus 15. Is that right? Do I have that right? 8 and 5 are 13, so that would yeah. be 23. Okay, so this gives us um, 
10 to the minus 18, I think, because we'd have 15 left to ER, 10 to the minus 18 over 18. So this is roughly uh, 10 to the minus 19. Um, over 2, so it's roughly 0 0.5, 10 to the minus 20 Kelvin. And that's, of course, a temperature way, 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 way below anything that we can detect with an instrument. Okay, um, so what I was going to discuss today um, was maximally symmetric spaces, killing vectors, and moving into conformal, uh, conformal uh, symmetry. All right, now what, what's, one of the nice things is that S2, S3, these are the spheres in the two-dimensional sphere in three dimensions, the three-dimensional sphere in four dimensions or higher. The hyperboloids H2 and H3, suitably, uh, properly defined, are all symmetric spaces. In fact, they're maximally symmetric. Maximally symmetric uh, spaces. And in fact, for the, um, the standard cosmology, um, what we do is we use a maximally, a maximally symmetric space for, the, for space, and then we have time vary. And the scale of the maximally symmetric space is the scale factor which evolves with time. So, um, and the maximally symmetric space is either S3 or I, I guess it is the H3. I don't normally think of that as a hyperbola, but I guess that's exactly what it is. Um, so let me first um, speak more generally about such things. Um, there was a German or Danish or I don't know, uh, Dutch uh, mathematician called Wilhelm Killing. And um, he introduced um, this uh, terminology. And in particular, a metric is an isometry of G prime IK of X prime is equal to G IK of X prime. Or equivalently, if, if, all right, so let me just, say what that actually means, it means that GIK of X prime DXI, DX, DX prime I, DX prime K is the same thing as GIK of X DXI DXK. The because you see, in that case, this would equal, if this is true, this would equal g prime i k of x prime dx prime i dx prime k. And one of the basic ideas of general relativity is that g i k dx i dx k is an invariant, and in other coordinates, dx prime i dx prime k, g prime i k would be the same as that. And um, the tricky thing is that um, is that these primes are uh, is that we're now saying that we can erase this prime because g prime and g are the same. So this is. This Wait, does the does the prime outside of the g mean in a different basis? Like you choose a different set of basis vectors to calculate the metric, or? Um, I hope this will become clear in a moment. Um, the idea is that um, we can make a space-time transformation, and under the space-time transformation, uh, in order to have this true, we would have a certain uh, g prime because of the trans because of the x to x prime 
uh, transformation. But because of that transformation and because of the nature of the metric, uh, we can erase the prime. So there are two things going on that you need for this to be true. You need a special metric and you need a special transformation. That's kind of funny because it, 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 it kills the prime. If you choose the metric correctly, the, the, the killing construction kills the prime. Uh, I, I think that, that just needs to be oh, like, That's probably a good way of thinking. Like, literal means, like the pointing vector actually points and the heavy side function is heavy on one side. And, uh, it's, it's fun. It's well, fun. It's fun. all right, that may be. Let's, 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 in, in, in. Let's consider this as an infinitesimal transformation. So here's an infinitesimal transformation that we want to be in an isometry. And uh, so what is g to lowest order? Well, g i k of x prime will be g i k of x plus g i k comma L epsilon y sub L because we're just changing x prime in this way. And so this is this is also of x if you want. But I think it might be easier to write it as simply well no, I think we better leave it this way. Okay. Um, also dx prime uh, I will be dxi plus epsilon y i comma j dxj. I use uh, comma and semicolon notation. You guys familiar with that? Let, let me just write it. Y i comma j is simply partial y i partial uh, x. J. And if we had a semicolon, it would be a covariant derivative. And a covariant derivative means that you bring in um, uh, a Christoffel symbol gamma, a capital gamma. Okay, so we know what g, g of x prime is, we know what the dx is, is. We want to satisfy this equation then, that this is equal to that. And so this is then g i k of x dx i dx k and I think I'm actually writing I think I actually have a typo here so let me just circle one later thought so I'm going to put um, primes in here so g at x prime dx prime dx k this would be from this equation, it would be g i k plus g i k comma l epsilon y l. So that's the g part. The d x i prime part is d x i plus epsilon y i comma j d x j. And then the dx prime k is dx k plus epsilon y k comma m dx m. Okay, if we now um, simplify this, what we see is that um, the main term um, uh, To lowest order, we can say that this is just uh, g of, actually now that I see this, oh, um, okay, this, we want to set this equal to g i k of x b x i b x k. Okay, so there wasn't really a typo, it's that this thing here is that, and we want that to be the same as this, and this I'm writing over here. And so this whole term cancels because we have here g i k, d x i, d x k. 
that cancels the right-hand side. And what we have left is GIK comma L Y L plus G I M Y M comma K plus G J K Y J comma I and all that is zero. So that's uh, that's the symmetry condition for an isometry. So it involves the metric times the vector. These vectors y are called killing vectors, and this is just the derivative of the metric. So if you have a vector y l. Um, that uh, satisfies this equation with this metric, then this vector y is a symmetry of the metric. Um, there's a, another way of writing this, and um, I'm not sure whether I should go through this, but uh, one of the fundamental properties of the, uh, of the metric uh, in general relativity is that the covariant derivative of the metric vanishes. And this allows us to rewrite the symmetry condition in the form 0 is yi semicolon k plus yk semicolon i. Another way of writing that is dk yi plus di yk. So now, there, um, is no, there, there should not be, uh, on the first term of the, the symmetry condition, um, that you just have y with the y where, 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 on, uh, down one line, that one on the first term, there's no sub subscript in indexing, or like co indexing, on the y term? It's y with an upper index. That's, that's it, nothing else? No derivatives. Right, nothing okay. else. Now, the, the, I think it might be instructive to show you how to go from here to there by using this. Okay. What we do is um, we subtract this equation, we subtract yik semicolon j from this equation. And um, since both are zero, what we get is zero is equal to gik comma l y l plus gim y m comma k plus gjk y j comma i minus G I K semicolon L Y L. So I've just boldly subtracted this from that and set the two equal to zero. But now what that is is I seem to be short on the equation. Did I leave something out? No, okay, it's all right. That, that, plus that, plus that, okay. So, I now want to subtract this, and the way we subtract that is we have minus g i k comma l y l plus g i m gamma m l k y l plus GKJ 
gamma J L I Y L. And now uh, some of these terms cancel, namely um, This term cancels the very first term, and so what we get is zero is equal to G I M Y M comma K plus G J K Y J comma I plus G I M gamma M L K Y L plus G K J gamma J L I Y L. Okay, now we can combine these. In other words, we combine this one with that one and this one with this one. And what we get is Zero is equal to G I M Y M comma K plus gamma M L K Y L plus G J K Y J comma I plus gamma J L I Y L. And now, if you look at these two, these are the definition of this is G I M Y M covariant derivative K plus G J K. Y J covariant derivative. Um, what is the covariant on the line, not the last line, but the line above in the second term? What is the covariant derivative with respect to on the first Y inside the parentheses on the G J K? That's oh, Y J. What is is that? Good a question. That's an I. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Sorry about not having any candy. Oh, no, that's okay. I just. And you, I think you did say this, but those are Christoffel symbols, and those are coming from the covariant derivatives. They're Christoffel symbols that are that are part of the definition of the of the covariant okay. derivative. All right, just making sure I'm on the same page. And. I'm not done though, um, because we haven't gotten to the final uh, equation here. The point is that the we're going to use the the covariant the fact that the covariant derivative of the metric tensor vanishes. We're going to use that again, and we're going to also use the fact that if we have a well, there's a type. If we have, you know that, of course, you know that the ordinary derivative is what's called a derivation. A derivation is a class of operators that's more general than derivatives. And uh, it's defined, a derivation is defined by this. This is equal to a comma kb plus a b comma k. So that says, this is just the ordinary derivative of a product equals the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. This is something that you learned in college or if you were educated in China, you learned it in high school. Um, anyway, um, it turns out that covariant derivatives are also derivations and this looks like this.
So the covariant derivative of a product is the covariant derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the covariant derivative of the second. And um, so that means then that if we take the covariant derivative of G I M Y, whoops, G I M Y M K plus the covariant derivative of G J K Y J in the ith direction. Well, this will be. The covariant derivative acting on G gives zero. The covariant derivative acting on G gives zero. And so this is just um, G I M Y M I plus G J K Y J comma I. And this is what we call Y M semicolon I plus Y K semicolon I. And um, so let's see where, right, so I have that those two are zero. And so the, so, okay, so this term is zero, but this is the same as that. And wait, I don't even know if I needed to do that. In fact, just using the G's, you can lower the M. And um, by definition, that's what it gives, right? It really yeah. All right. That's another. Yeah. It's in other words, G I M that. In other words, if you weren't sure you could lower the index, this shows that you can lower the index. That's a way of thinking about it. We essentially just did one addition and to prove that that's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, now let's see. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys want to see of, of, of this. Uh, would you like to see the, uh, the, well, first of all, this is, what we've got here is an equation, this is an equation for a killing vector given a metric. Um, or it's an equation for a metric given a killing vector. And um, so in other words, we can use Either condition, either um, the first condition was this one, and this is equivalent to this one. So the two box conditions, um, we can use either one, and we can use it either to find the symmetry of a known metric or to find a metric that has a given symmetry. This, it's uh, the y, the vector y, the killing vector tells you what the symmetry is, and the um, post metric tells you what the space is. I think maybe it would be good to do an example. So let me do an example for the sphere S2. Um, the first killing vector is actually very simple. It's y1 with a theta component so these are coordinates on the sphere, theta and phi. And this is very simple. So that's the killing vector. Um, the, ki the, the condition, uh, these conditions here say what? Well, um, the derivatives are going to be 0 because the vector is a constant. And um, so what this says, and in fact, one of them is, is actually 0. So y theta is 0. And so
So what this says is, maybe, I don't, I don't know if we want to go through it in detail, but it basically says that the phi derivative of the metric vanishes. So the metric is independent of phi. For every metric. Excuse me? For every metric. Oh, no, no, no. No, no this, no, just no. this metric. So in other words, the idea is you pick a killing vector, and then you learn something about the metric. Or you pick a metric, and you try to figure out what the killing vectors are. What, 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 are, what is the freedom of choice for the killing vector? How many different ways, for instance, for, for the, the sphere here, can we choose y theta and y theta? Well, I am. What, what, do, what does it? I guess it's not clear to me what exactly it has to obey. Um, yeah, all right. It's 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 not super transparent to me either. But basically, it's that here, what we're saying is that this is a killing vector. So what do we learn? Suppose and suppose we have a metric that depends upon theta and phi, yeah. and this is the killing vector. We're going to find the metric now. Right. And the way we find the metric is, um, since this is 0, 1, we take that and put it into this equation. And um, what, what do we get? Well, it was 0, 1, so, uh, so the, the theta derivative here is well, all of these are zero because the thing is a constant. Maybe, maybe we should do this in detail. How? So, what we get. So let me go back here. So, what what do we have? We have zero equals. Now, in this, this is going to be G I K, comma L. But the only L that's non-zero is phi. And y phi is 1. So that's what I'm doing is this equation. 0 is gik comma l yl plus gim ym comma k plus gjk yj comma i. So this is the equation, but an i and k just theta and phi. So this term gives us this. Now over here, um, uh, once again, the only the the only one that can uh, come up is um, where's the derivative? We can only have y. There are no derivatives, so both these two terms are zero. So this is all we get. Right. So in other words, immediately we get this result. All right. Um, it doesn't uniquely determine the metric, it just kind of tells us something about the structure. Excuse me? I'm saying it doesn't uniquely determine the metric. It just oh, no, no, we, no, 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 no. We only use one killing vector. Oh, yeah. We're going to have another one. I see. The second, there, we have three of them, actually. The second one is y2 theta, y2 phi is sine phi cotangent theta, cosine phi. And the third one I have two ways of writing phi and I write them like that. This is cosine phi minus cotangent theta sine phi. Okay. So these are the two conditions. Now, if we look at this equation and we set, um, we look at g, we look at uh, g theta phi, then We already know that the phi derivative is zero. So this is just equal to gik 
comma theta, y theta. y theta is sine phi. Let's use the first one. Um, plus Now, unfortunately, we've got to do both of them there. We've got to do... It looks like you're going to have to decouple these. Like they're like you want me to just give you the answer? Yeah, I'm fine with that. <laughs> it's, this, it's, is, this is very challenging. Okay. If we said... Oh, I'm sorry. I and k equal to theta. All right, I should read my notes more carefully. Let's consider I and k equal to theta. Then we have g theta theta comma theta y theta is sine phi in one case and what's the rest of this this would be g theta m y m but k k is also theta and the theta thing is just the second one so this would be g theta phi, and it would be the derivative, the theta derivative, of, it would be cosine phi times cotangent theta comma theta plus gj, and the other one is theta, Y, all right, I'll just write it as J for now, and a comma theta. Well, the, theta, the only theta derivative is again this, and so this is basically this plus G um, something theta. And it's g phi theta. So it's the sum of these two times that is equal to zero. And um, of course, these two are equal because metrics are symmetric. So this is 0 equals g theta theta comma theta sine phi plus 2 g theta phi cosine phi. Does anybody know what the derivative of cotangent theta is? It's like cosecant squared, I think. Huh? It's cosecant squared theta. So or one over sine like, squared? Yeah. Is, is there a minus sign? Uh, I think it. I think cotangent does because the. I just always remember. Here, here, here. Use, use, use the internet. Let's get it right. <laughs> yeah, I think they're right. Uh, just, of, do, just of cotangent. Cotangent is whatever tangent. Well. So yeah, you're getting a minus sign. There's a minus sign? Uh, I think there's a minus sign. Okay, so one is equal to the other. The derivative of cotangent is uh, the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So it's probably going to be minus c minus cosecant cotangent, right? No, I think it's just minus cosecant squared. I think it's just minus cosecant squared. Because well, the way, I mean, let's just do it with a, I'm just going to do it with a part. All right, well, let me just tell you what the answer is. The answer is that g theta theta comma theta is zero, and um, that g theta phi is equal to zero. So somehow this equation tells us that both of them have to be zero. I, I mean, this, this is... Well, I think, I think, I mean, is it not the case that, I mean, sure, that's, that's one equation, but you also need to look at the other Yeah, yeah that's thing. right, that's right. And we and have two equations here. You get two equations and, and then you can figure it out. If we had, had done the two equations, I guess we'd get the same equation, but that we'd have a cosine here and a sine there. 
and yeah. setting those two, yeah. if both equations held, the only way for them to, held, to hold is yeah. for these two things to be zero. Mm -hmm. So, good point. Um, yeah, it's because it gets In any event, the, the final equation that one oh, gets is um, if you set ik equal to phi phi, uh, you get you find that g phi phi comma theta is two cotangent theta uh, times g phi phi, and that gives us a uh, the g phi phi is equal to sine squared theta, and um, so this turns so g turns out to be the metric of the sphere, um, and that is then uh, that um, the metric G is then sine squared theta zero, zero, and I think one, I think that's one. Plug from an overall constant. Yeah, there's also the R factor, but we're we're just saying it's on the sphere, right? We're on yeah, the Yeah, this is just two dimensions, yeah. Alright, so let me the hyperboloid, so now let's go in the opposite direction. The hyperboloid metric is this. G is equal to uh, R squared. Oh, I have R units. And this one is R squared cinch squared of theta and e to zero. So one could have had R squared here. Oh, can, um, can I can I just like ask like a clarification sort of yeah. question? So the idea here is is that we like we could have pretended like oh we're just going to guess like we're going to say ah suppose we have these random killing vectors. What's the metric corresponding to right. killing vectors? Right, right. The and killing vectors, the killing vectors give you a symmetry. Yeah. And so you ask, what can, given a symmetry, what yeah. can the metric be to have this symmetry? So, so yeah, so, 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 so how do I know what symmetry we have here given those killing vectors? I mean, I'm sure it's some like... Well, the, the symmetry, symmetry is defined over here. Three. It's a... This is the this is the infinitesimal form of the symmetry. Maybe yeah. you should turn the camera around. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, it's a so this is the symmetry, and uh, in in this particular case, it would be uh, theta prime is theta plus epsilon, and um, what what were the vectors? One vector was um, one was zero one. Yeah. Right, zero one. And uh, so this would just be theta prime equals theta, phi prime equals phi plus uh, epsilon times um, what? Yeah, just phi plus epsilon. So this is just a rotation about the z-axis. Okay. Um, that's exactly. one symmetry. And then the others, though, are rather confusing. Um, they, they, uh, maybe it would be useful to write them down. Um, so, is this in your book? Yeah. This, 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 this well, in the second or, edition, it's not in the first edition. Okay, you're going to include this in the second edition. Yeah. So, x, x prime theta, oh, well, it's theta prime is theta plus, now there are two terms actually for the second case. It is um, epsilon times sine phi. Yeah. Let me just make sure I got this. And B prime is B plus epsilon, and the other thing is cotangent theta. 
cosine phi. So that's, that's something in which you change both, um, it's an infinitesimal change in which you change both theta and phi. And then the other one is, let us say, theta double prime is theta plus epsilon. And here it's cosine phi. Um, and phi double prime is phi plus epsilon, and now it's minus epsilon, uh, cotangent theta. Oh, wait a second, I've got this. Oh, I did that right, yeah, cotangent theta and uh, sine phi. And I didn't work out uh, what those actually correspond to, but since one was a rotation about the z-axis, it's very possible that the other two are rotation about the x-axis and rotation about the y-axis. And um, if you rotate about the x-axis, you're going to change theta. It's not obvious to change phi. Um, why wouldn't, it, why wouldn't it three vectors to settle down the? Why would you three three vectors to settle down the matrix? Metric. Why would we have three? Yes. Why would we need three vectors to settle down the metric? Well, it it just turns out that the, 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 that depending components. Let's see. Here, what we've started out yeah, with is, is that we're given three symmetries yes. and. Given those three symmetries and the fact that it's a two-dimensional space tells you that it's got to be a sphere in two dimensions. And, um, and then when you think about the sphere in two dimensions, you can rotate about the z-axis and nothing changes, the x-axis nothing changes, the y-axis nothing changes. Whether these are x and y, I'm not actually sure because I'm having trouble see what happens to phi when you do an x rotation. When you do a y rotation, I guess phi does change. But All right, anyway, let's... Let's, let's, let's not get into this in too much detail. Um, let's go the other way now with the hyperboloid. So we start with this metric, and now what we want to do is we want to find um, killing vectors that satisfy these, the, the condition. And the condition, of course, is the, the boxed condition. Either this in terms of covariant derivative, which is sort of complicated, so let's just look at this condition in terms of uh, just ordinary vectors. So let me write down that condition over here. It's just um, that zero is g i k comma l y l plus g i m y m comma k plus g j k y j comma i. So that's what we want. We know what the metric is, it's this, and now uh, we can verify that certain ones work. Um, y1 theta, y1 phi in this case is 0, 1, which I guess is the same as what we had before. And now what we have is g theta theta. Uh, comma theta is zero, and also g theta theta comma phi is zero, and because g theta phi is equal to g phi theta, and both are zero, and moreover g phi phi comma phi is zero. So we have all kinds of, um, all sorts of zeros. And um, 
So what we find from this is we get that y theta, theta has to be zero. Um, and so, and then from this, what we find is that y phi comma phi is minus the hyperbolic cotangent of theta times y theta. And we also find that y theta comma phi is equal to minus sinc squared theta times y phi comma theta. And these are sufficient to tell us what the uh, other two vectors are. And y2 is um, y2 theta, y2 phi. These are equal to, well, it's actually simpler than that. Hold on. Sine phi times uh, one plus hyperbolic cotangent of the, one comma hyperbolic cotangent of uh, theta, and y three is equal to cosine phi minus hyperbolic cotangent of theta times sine phi. I hope there's no typo here, um, because it seems to me that um, I would have factored that if, um, so I'm going to have to look at this again. All right, so these are two examples of the fact that you can, um, that if you're given the metric, you can find the killing vectors. That's what we just sort of did over here. And then for the sphere, um, uh, given the sphere, uh, you can find the um, given the killing vectors, you can find the metric. Is the, is the hyperbola a, ma a maximally symmetric space with respect to the symplectic group? It's maximally symmetric in the sense that it has the greatest number of killing vectors. Oh, maximally symmetric just means greatest number of killing vectors. Yeah. Cool. But, but For a given dimension. It's the same thing. What I, the killing vector relates because these, they form, yeah. like the, 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 the group of these form a symplectic manifold. Somehow. I don't remember. Okay. I saw that in differential yeah. geometry yeah. a long time ago, and I, I, there's a way to like, sure. go through the really elaborate yeah. construction with these things. Yeah. But it, it is that. So, um, uh, the, the thing I like about this, you see, is that. Um, this idea of a maximally symmetric space is nice. And then the, the relationship between maximally symmetric three spaces and the standard model of cosmology is interesting. Because in the Robinson and Walker cosmologies, what you have is two, you pick, there are, there are three maximally symmetric three spaces. Um, one is uh, S3, one is H3, and the other one is just flat Euclidean three space, which is obviously very symmetrical. And these are the three three spaces that go into Robinson-Walker cosmology. And the idea is from, from, from astronomical observations, as far as we can tell, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, so we want maximal symmetry in the space part and then we let the uh, scale factor of the space part vary with time, and that gives you the uh, Robinson, Walker, Lemaitre uh, cosmology. 
doesn't that, have left somebody else out. Isn't that to say that on the largest observable scales, the universe is flat? The well, 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 flat's another issue. Um, it does turn out that to uh, exp uh, with present instruments, one can't tell whether, one can't tell which of these maximally symmetric spaces is most appropriate. Um, and that's been a terrible disappointment. Do these correspond to, to the closed, finite, open, infinite, those kind of, like the closed and finite? Well, yeah, space? yeah, that's another thing. Up there, clearly, if it's S3, then the space part is finite, because it's the surface of a sphere. But if it's H3, it's infinite, and if it's flat space, totally flat, it's infinite. Okay, so, um, let me just mention something. This is just a definition, Lie derivative for a vector y on some vector fi, what is this? Well, it's yl fi comma l minus fl yi comma l. And, and you can also write that as yl fi semicolon L, in other words, a covariant derivative, minus F L Y I semicolon L. So that's the Lie derivative. And um, uh, this last fact that you can go from here to here means that basically you could stick in a gamma. And the reason you can stick in a gamma is the Y L gamma I L K F K is the same thing as F L gamma I L K Y K and um, well that's pretty that's obvious when you realize that these guys are symmetric in the lower indices. And so this is a the Lie derivative of a contravariant vector, the Lie derivative of a covariant vector is uh, Y L V I comma L plus V L Y L comma I. And you can also rewrite this as Y L V I semicolon L plus V L, Y, L, comma, I. Okay, so that's, that's enough of that, I think. What is the utility of this? I know that it relates to what he has before us in play manifolds. I know that we can... Okay, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Yeah, Say what, it again. What is the utility of this? this of what? These, these leaderships? I mean, I know that... You know, I don't know. I just put them in for completeness. I'm, I'm not going to do a hell of a lot with them, but... Just some people. I mean, they obviously had uses, and what was happening at the time, by the way, was that Lee and Killing were both working on um, on symmetries, and um, Lee apparently came out ahead reputation-wise. Maybe it's because Killing has such a terrible last name <laughs> that. Uh, Nobody wanted to talk about killing groups. That just sounds gruesome. <laughs> so, um, what is the difference between, or what, 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 what is the difference between a killing vector and a killing field? What is, what is a killing Oh, but I think they're just the same. It, it's, it's, it's the same. Because this vector y depends upon x, so it's a field. It a field is just anything that depends upon space time. All right, let me just uh, tell you a a, a, a few things here. You can, by the way, the Reed Lee derivative of the, um, oh, yeah, in fact, all right, the, it, it is worthwhile to go a little bit further with this Lee derivative. Let's look at the Lee derivative of a second rank covariant uh, tensor. Well, that'll be YL PIK comma L plus TLK 
y l comma i plus t i l y l comma k. Now, if we look at the case where t is g, then l sub y of g i k, well, this is y l g i k comma l plus g l k y l comma i plus g i l y l comma I have that twice g i l y l comma k I hope I have that right yeah all right that looks great right. this it turns out is the condition that y be a symmetry so the condition is that this equals zero so the vanishing of the wife Lee derivative of the metric tensor uh, is the condition that y be a symmetry or an isometry. I'll put these notes on the class web page. Um, so uh, let me just mention a couple of things as facts. Uh, suppose we have d dimensions. Um, so a maximally symmetric space has d translations. And d, d minus 1 over 2 rotations. So a, a total of D, D plus 1 over 2 symmetries, or equivalently that many killing vectors. Um, so if we have D equal to 2, we have one rotation of two translations. We have d equal to three. We have three rotations, three translations, altogether six. And d equal to four, we have six rotations and four translations. Rotation here is in the general sense, and if you have if you have a space time, then three of the rotations are ordinary rotations, the other three are Lorentz transformations. So you have six Lorentz transformations, four translations, that's the um, Poincaré group. Now, it turns out that if you have a maximally symmetric space, Symmetric space has a curvature tensor R I J K L, which is a constant times G I K G J L minus G I L G J K. So that's a that is a um, that tells you that there aren't very many of these maximally symmetric spaces. And um, uh, it turns out that uh, the Ricci tensor RJL is, let me just make this quicker, it is also proportional to the, it's proportional to the metric itself, and the scalar is just a constant CD, D minus 1. So, these maximally symmetric spaces have a constant, um, uh, the, the curvature scalar is a constant. Okay, um, so that's an, un, un, it's not enough of that, but that's all we have time for. If, if we had more time, then 
the thing to have done would have been to go through those examples in more detail. Um, let's now go to conformal algebra. So if we're going to conformal algebra, recall an isometry is g prime i k of x prime is equal to g i k of x prime. In other words, you what that equation is telling us is that if you make the coordinate transformation x goes to x prime, the prime metric is the same thing as the ordinary metric. That's what that is saying. There's a looser condition, which is uh, a conformal transformation, or conformally related, or should I say conformality? Would that be the right term? <laughs> Conformity. Mm -hmm. I just want so. so there's you want to go with conformity? Yeah, let's go. Symmetry between the word isometry and conformity. I like yeah, I like that. All right, let's go with conformity. A conformity is the g prime i k of x prime is some positive number, omega squared of x prime, g i k of x prime. So, in other words, um, you make this transformation x to x prime and then you get g prime of x prime. It's not the same metric, it's the same metric stretched. And, you, and an equivalent condition is that of course this thing, g i k of x prime, is equal to uh, XL comma I prime XM comma K prime GLM of X. So it's that this should equal that. And now we can say, well, let's look at an infinitesimal transformation. X prime L is XL plus epsilon YL. So YL is going to be this killing vector, but it, this is now a killing vector for a conformity rather than for an isometry. Or should we call it a conformatory? Do you like that better? Yeah, I, I think that we can, I like conformatory too. Either one is fine. We're going to have to get this up on the uh, I pretty quick so nobody else takes this. Okay. Okay, so let's go with our conformatory. And we're going to say here that omega squared of x prime, we're going to say omega squared is 1 plus epsilon times little omega of x prime. And I'm leaving out the square just because it's too tiresome. So the conformal condition then is GLM times delta L i minus epsilon y L comma i delta M k minus epsilon y M comma k is equal to 1 plus epsilon omega g i k plus epsilon y L G I K comma L. So it's it's very much like the it's very much like the isometry condition or the symmetry condition for a killing vector Y. For conformal killing vector, we've got this extra term omega. That's the only difference. And so now the, the key equation then is, which I guess I'll, I'll write down here, G I M Y M comma K plus G 
LKYL comma I plus YLGIK comma L plus omega GIK equals zero. And so I'll just put this in a circle rather than a box to indicate that it's the formal condition as opposed to the uh, as opposed to the other one. It serves the same purpose, though, with the exception of now we have to worry about this this scale factor. Yeah, this is more general, and if you require omega to be zero, then you've got a nice sum of charge. And um, if you take this thing, multiply by g i k upper and sum. What you get is an equation for omega, namely omega is minus a quarter two y i comma i plus y l g i k g i k comma l. So you can derive a formula for omega. from uh, the equation, the con the, from the conformal equation, you can derive an equation for omega. So that's a y here. And that is a g. And that's a g. And that's a y. Um, all right, I think since we're out of time, I think we ought to just sort of stop now. Um, but I'll put these on the class web page. And um, if the, by the way, we've been in curve space. What we're going to do pretty soon is um, consider conf uh, conformal symmetry in flat space, Minkowski space, and that then will give us um, uh, will give us the the conformal algebra, and um, so in, in other words, previously what we were, were doing was we said. We could either take the metric and look for the killing vectors, or we could take the killing vectors and look for the metric. Here, we're given the metric as Minkowski space, look for the killing vectors. The killing vectors are those then that generate the Poincaré algebra, and then two extra symmetries, a dilation and a kind of an inversion. If you're interested in seeing this like in a little bit more mathematical detail. There's a nice book by this guy from he's he's a physicist from Caltech, but he does really heavily mathematical stuff. And it's a it's a yeah. small book, but it, the focus of it is on just proofs of this. But it's very readable. In other words, you don't need to you don't need to have years of of geometry and topology no. to you know, barely like math textbooks when you see this stuff. But it, it's nice, it's like a nice new Is it uh, is it on B dash or I'm sure it is. It's a Cambridge text. Uh, well not all the Cambridge stuff. Yeah there. sometimes they'll get ripped down but I'm sure you can find it. But it is right. um, well, it's, the, the, the rule basically is if it's a book you want, get it quickly before the link goes. No sure. I'm not sure. Or Anyway, it's 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 like a happy medium because he does physics examples. He, he's writing to like both audiences, so it's kind of nice. Oh, you, know, nice you can read it without getting too wrapped up in physics examples or without getting too carried away with proofs. So, so we turn this all. Okay. So sure. Yeah, and it's real thin too.